good morning, a blessed <coughs> Lord's Day again to everybody. It's good to see you all here. And, uh, I'm, I'm ex kind of especially uh, happy or warm. My heart is warm today. I have an old friend that I uh, haven't seen in a long time. And uh, it's Clay He's sitting right there. So y'all say hi to him. And, and uh, it's been a long time, and it's good to see him this morning. Um, I want to speak to you this morning about overcoming. And if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verses 3 through 6. Now, every, every single one of us, we have goals, we have dreams, we have aspirations. And uh, whether the task ahead of us is simply surviving uh, by meeting the needs of ourselves or our family, or we may have goals as noble as as uh, bringing one person to the knowledge of the saving grace of Christ, and and everything between there. It could you you're, what what you want to do in this life, or, or for the next uh, 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 days that God has given you, uh, it could fall anywhere in between there, from the simplest of the physical things of, of meeting your basic needs to the most miraculous and the spiritual. All of us have plans. We also have setbacks and we have obstacles, things that we have to overcome. And today that's what we're going to look at. We're talking about overcoming because uh, we do have an adversary. We have a foe that, that wants us defeated and he'll go to great lengths using every resource he can to keep us down. So let's read 2 Corinthians 10. Three through six. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that the power that is available to us from you is greater than the power that the enemy has in our lives. Your word teaches us that and tells us that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Father, if we're going to truly be overcomers, we need your spirit living inside of us. We need the power of your Holy Spirit to overcome. We need you, Jesus. We need your word. We need your truth. I pray that you impart that upon us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, to overcome simply means to subdue, to, to conquer, to prevail, to get the victory. Uh, how many here this morning like to win? I think most everybody here. We like to win. Uh, and today, uh, I want to help you win in, 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 the, in the spiritual realm, in the, in the, the part of your life that uh, it seems like it's less important. It seems like it's less prevalent. But actually, everything in our lives is, is rooted in the spiritual. And that's how we're going to overcome, even the things in this physical body. And the first thing that we need to do uh, to, to overcome is to recognize the enemy. 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he has told them that, that hey, Timothy is coming ahead of me. Uh, I'm coming soon, he says, but for now I'm going to tarry in Ephesus because, and if you look at verse 9, he says, For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are a great many adversaries. <coughs> so you see, Paul has had, he's had this door opened, this, this great opportunity that's been opened to him, but, it, but he also says there are many adversaries. So understand this. With every opportunity, there comes challenges. Your dreams will not come unopposed. It may be uh, your marriage. 
uh, your family, your business, maybe a ministry, it may be personal healing, it could be any relationship, it doesn't matter. Satan will come to oppose you. He wants you down, he wants you defeated. And, and so know this, just because you face difficulties doesn't mean you're out of God's will because we all are going to face uh, the enemy in some way or the other. Satan, the word says, has come to kill, steal, and destroy. And I want you to know that he's a creep and he, he'll, use, he'll use envy, he'll use discouragement, he'll use fear, he'll use depression, and a host of others to make you give up, want to give up, back off, and not realize your dreams. You see, and, and, and let, me, let me say here, we must, uh, we must discern sometimes. I, we don't want to give Satan too much credit. You know, sometimes it's our own stupidity, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, really, when we do stupid things and it costs us, you know, don't blame that on Satan. We knew better. We know better. So we must need, need to discern uh, and not give, give Satan too much credit. You know, you had a flat tire. I mean, it doesn't mean that you're under attack. You may have just kept putting off getting that tire repaired. You know, every, you know you're putting a quarter in, you know, every other day or so. That's, that's not a spiritual attack. Uh, you know, somehow many of uh, I believe, believe that Christians don't have any of these <laughs> difficult times and things to deal with. And, and, and you know that's ridiculous. I suppose there, the idea is that when you're saved, the enemy quits, or maybe they uh, disassociate these things from Satan because that would mean that he's present in their lives. And, and you know, no one wants to believe that, that uh, uh, any part of them is being influenced by Satan. But let me remind you, you know Peter was one of the eleven. You know he was right there with Jesus for three years and, and followed him. And, and when Jesus revealed to him, he said, you know, I, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I, I'm going to go. I'm going to die on the cross. Peter said, never, Lord. What did he say? He said, get thee from behind me, Satan, because you are, for, are mindful of the things of man and not the things of God. So if, if Peter can be influenced by Satan, then I, I say that, you know, you or I or me or any of us can be influenced by Satan. Uh, but there's, there's this part of us that doesn't want to believe that. We want to think of Satan as the, as the guy with horns, you know, on the TV, or, or you know, uh, all the, the people who are on murder, murderer's row or whatever, you know, death row for murdering. We want to think that he is, he is the, he, he, so hideous and, and, and awful and, and, and all those type of things. But, you know, the truth is, he's into to the minds of, of every one of us. He wants to be. Doesn't have to be, but he wants to be. So, if he can do that, if he can make us think that Satan is elsewhere, then we, are, we become deceived. And if we're deceived by uh, a Satan and convinced that our problems are not spiritual, then you see he's won the battle. It's over. And, and we'll be caught in his snare forever unless our eyes are open. Look at, look at our text, verse 3, it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. I believe what Paul is saying here, you see, sometimes we have a problem in, in, in this, this natural order of life, in this physical flesh, and we think we've got to take care of it that way as well. And, and, uh, and he's saying, you know, everything, every difficult, every problem, every obstacle, everything that we struggle with, it has a spiritual base, a spiritual nature that needs to be dealt with. Uh, the war is not in the flesh. We'll never conquer the enemy when we use physical means alone. You know, we, we may get temporary help, but, but most of the time, if we don't spiritually take care of the problem, go to the root of the problem, uh, the problem remains. So we must recognize the enemy. We must not allow him to continue to, to, to deceive us. Listen, I, as your pastor, I, I struggle at times. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm an open book and I'm honest with you. I struggle at times and have in the past with fears of failure, uh, fears of, of not being qualified, fears of being uh, of inadequate. And you know what? I have good company because throughout the Bible, great men and women of God, they had the same thing. You know, Moses, you know, oh Lord, I can't, I can't. I, 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 I have a problem talking and speaking. I can't be... Be the leader. I can't be your spokesman. And God said, yes, you can. So, I mean, this is, a, this is a human thing. This is something that not to be ashamed of. 
Uh, and at some point, you see, Moses overcame. He had faith. Every, Abraham overcame. Everybody, every great leader, they overcame the things that this body and this flesh would uh, uh, keep them down with. And this is what he's calling us to do. Whatever it is, whatever the difficulty, if we allow our faith to fade away and shrink in fear, we're going to miss out. We'll start overanalyzing. We'll start saying, I can't, we can't, it'll never work. And then the fear of failure will start and begin and, uh, and, and, and it'll keep us down. Don't talk yourself out of persevering. You must be willing to stretch yourself. You must be willing to get out uh, of your comfort zone. Uh, you know, the, the play it safe mentality will keep you from experiencing God's best, I believe. We must be willing to step out and follow God, even if we make mistakes, even if it means taking chances, even if there's a fear of failure. I ask you this morning, have you got new opportunities facing you? That have you doubting? Have you worried? Maybe a new career, career change. Maybe a new job. <coughs> maybe there's problems at work. Uh, some of you may be going, want to go back to school. You see, I believe that God is pleased when we step out, especially when the new opportunity affords us a closer walk with Him uh, and fulfills our divine calling and purpose. Playing it safe most often keeps us stagnant. Have you? Did you ever notice when, I noticed this when I was a small kid, if you, if you ever come to a, a pool of water that's stagnant in the summertime, there'd be these little things in there, be, we call them wiggy wands, and they just, they jump and they move around like that. That's a mosquito larva. Hmm. And, and that's, 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 they can only, they can only reproduce in stagnant water. Running water, they can't do it. And I said, I, I use that because I want you just that to stick out in your mind that, that uh, we don't need to be stagnant. <coughs> God's will most often will, will push and stretch you, and, it, and, it, and at times it may even make you uncomfortable. And, and it also will make us dependent on Him, and this is where God wants us. He wants us to be dependent upon Him. If, if everything in our lives is predictable, and everything we have planned out, and everything we have figured out, and we make things go according to plan, then we really don't need God's help now, do we? That's right. Because we can do it on our own. That's right. think, of where, think of where David was when he faced Goliath. He really had no chance. He was as good as dead. You ask anyone in that valley, you ask me, the, the Israelites, his own people, that he was representing, uh, and, and, and I tell you, they would have put their money on the giant. But see, God saw his faith, and he helped. And that first rock found its mark. What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They refused to bow down to the golden idols, and their steadfast faith caught God's attention, and they were bound and put into the fiery furnace, and the, the king said, I see four in there. And they came out without even the smell of smoke. You see, if you don't ever place yourself in a position or a place where uh, you can't do it on your own means and your own talents and your own abilities, then, then we're, we're never putting our place in, in, a, in a situation where we allow God to work in our lives and help us and, and do something for us. See, when, when we come to the end of our own means and our own natural abilities, that's when we will see and experience God's supernatural. If we sit back satisfied sit back stagnant and afraid to risk, then we're not going to see the greatness of God. We've got to be totally dependent upon God. Sink or swim, we must say, Lord, I'm going with you. Well, you may be thinking, well, God, I'm willing to step out if you'll just show me what's coming up next. Give me a word of uh, 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 revelation, a word of knowledge. Tell me, show me, give me a sign. Well, let me tell you that here. If, think about this. If He continually showed us signs, pointing the direction, telling us what was ahead, there would be no need for faith. That's right. How can we please God without faith? That's 
If we knew everything, you see, the, the lust for, for, for supernatural signs and uh, 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 some call it a word of knowledge, they, they may call it, it may impress some people, but I believe most often, and I'm going out on a limb here, and you, some people are going to say, well, you're crazy, Pastor. Most often I think it's from Satan. I'm not saying God doesn't give a word of knowledge. It happens. There's been two times in my life where God said, yes, and this is, what, this is the direction, this is what you want, and I knew it. But you know, it seems like every Sunday there's somebody who's got three or four words to sign for you. A, a word of knowledge for you. And you see, think about it this way. How many people today are fascinated with horoscope, with astrology, palm readers, anything, anything that, that they perceive will foretell their future. You see, there's that part of us that wants to know. And there's that part of us that 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 things that we want to know and we need to know and we got to know. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through any links, any avenues to, 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 to believe somebody. We want to believe somebody. And I'm telling, what I'm telling you is that God occasionally does this, but most of the time He doesn't. We need, to, we need to walk by faith. We need to live by faith. God has promised us eternity with Him. And see, that's the most important thing we need to know. Amen? All the rest must be fleshed out on the earth until the day we see him face to face. And God will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. See, I believe that this walk in this flesh, uh, most often we, we do not know what tomorrow brings. We don't know what the next hour brings. And we have to take a step by faith. And I believe God takes that step right with us. It, you know... What I'm telling you is that you won't always feel 100% sure of the next moment, the next hour. Right. You know, we have plans. We, we have goals. We have dreams. And, and that's good. But, but we must live by faith. We must live trusting God. We must accept with confidence that God will help us. So, uh, I, I guess I can also say get out of your self-reliant dependent zone where we handle and we calculate and we want everything. What happens when we do that? When we live that way, how do we, what happens? Not, we get, we, we fail. Our plans don't come together. Somebody steps in and turns the whole card over and then what happens? We're so full of anxiety. We're full of anger. We're full of hatred for that person that, that messed up my plans and we get all upset because we're depending on on our own self-reliant, we're in that zone of, of making things happen. You know, the movers and the shakers, the people that can make it happen. And I'm not against goals, I'm not against plans, but what I'm saying is we need to get out of this, this self-reliant dependent zone and we need to get into a faith zone where God will have a chance to work in your life. Where, where, where you know, every move, every step is not planned out. And He can move and He can direct your past. And He can uh, make you go where He wants you to go. Amen. Amen. Do you remember the story of Joshua? In Joshua 1.5, He said, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. They're trying to get to the promised land. He says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong, Joshua. Be of good courage. This promise is for you. It's for all of God's children. In chapter 3, it tells about the day they were about to, to finally enter into the promised land. And, and Joshua had told, uh, God had told Joshua to, to get them up. Get them up early. Joshua knew something great was going to happen, but he didn't know what. He didn't know how. And he said, line them up. He said, send, send, the, send the Ark of the Covenant out first. And he did just what God uh, told him to do. He obeyed. And as God instructed, He ordered the priest to take the ark and go ahead. And as soon as the soles of their feet dipped the edge of the water, the waters of the Jordan piled up before their very eyes. You see, that's faith. Take a step of faith and watch what God will do. We'll have, you know, we'll all have periods where everything seems to be going wrong. Nothing seems to be good to be happening. Uh, the end of this week has been like that for me. Uh, Amy's in, in Huntsville with the grandbaby and my son and daughter-in-law and I, I, I wanted to be with them and, and, and I've got so many things going on now. I've been time pressured. It's just, you know, sometimes things just don't go, go well for you and things are rough and, and, you, and you feel bad and you feel anxious. And, yeah. 
It happens sometimes. Well, I want to encourage you this morning to stand strong. <coughs> I, yesterday, yesterday, preparing this message, you know, I was just overwhelmed by all the things that are coming at me and too many things going on, and I just had to say, Mark, stop. Stop being anxious. Your God is well able to handle this. He is well able to bring about things that you're being anxious about. He's well able to take care of the things that you don't know. So stop, Mark. Just rest in Him. Ephesians 6 says, Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Don't ever quit when you know the enemy is trying to make you give up. Stand your ground and eventually he will back off. And you can claim new ground. I know. Sunday morning... Uh, uh, for us, it's back when the boys were like this, they were horrible for Amy and I. I mean, it would be like get nothing. I mean, one would be fighting the other one. They'd be fussing them for you, not me and Amy. Be fussing them. I can't tell you. There's probably been a handful of times on Sunday morning when the kids were going up. I said, "Well, you just go. I don't want to go. I'm not going." <laughs> and you know what? Amy would go and take the boys. And she said, oh, Mark, what a beautiful service. Oh, you should have been there. And you know what? There was times when I said that, and then I said, well, you know what? I need to go. Come on, we're going. Let's go. And I would get there, and God would speak to me. And it would be just what I needed. So that's what I'm talking about. You've got to persevere. I mean, when, 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 when Satan is coming against you, and you know it, you've got you to stand and stand there for it. That's when you need to go to church the most. That's when you need the Spirit of God to, to enable you and take over your emotions and the things that, that, are, uh, that are coming at you. The enemy, he doesn't like your decision to go forward. He's happy. He was happy when I stayed at home. Or, I, or, I, or when my little temper tantrum made the whole family stay home. He's happy then. He's happy when you stay home moping. About how bad things are. About how mad you are at your wife or your husband. I say to you this morning, persevere. It's worth the effort. Yes. You know, it takes more energy to fret, worry, and be mad and angry than it does to make up your mind to have a good attitude. That's a fact. It's been proven that it takes far many more muscles to frown than it does to smile. And it's the same way spiritually. It's far easier to have a positive, vibrant outlook than to be negative. It, it's, really, it's not always easy, but it's healthier. It's better for you. If we will just resolve to do that with the help of God and His Spirit, not only will we overcome and live victoriously, we'll be better off physically. Listen, uh, I, I've shared with you before about I had a blood pressure one time, and problem one time, and, and my life was, I mean, I was working 60, 65 hours a, a week, and and, uh, and that's probably the time when I was throwing a little tantrums on Sunday morning because I was so tired. I was so tired working one Monday through Saturday and come home and all I wanted to do was sleep and, oh, we got to go to church. You know, but at that time, my blood pressure was high, sky high. And I didn't take any blood pressure medicine, but I changed my life. I quit that job that was, that was 65 hours a week. I just one day went in there and quit. You know, I had enough. I said, I, this is my two weeks. Two weeks and that's it. I changed my life. I made changes in my life. Yeah. I, I, I trusted God more. I relied on Him more. And I started my own business. And not that that's easy, but you know, I, you know, I relaxed much more. My blood pressure started coming down. You see, we can overcome any obstacle with determination and reliance on God. When we've done all we know to do, God has... And can turn what Satan means for evil into good. Do you believe that this morning? Yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. If you look at Genesis 50, 20, it's the it's a summation of a whole story of, of Joseph. And, and you may know the story how his brother sold him into slavery, threw him in a pit. He was uh, accused of, of uh, uh, adultery. He was thrown into prison. I mean, he had so many things come against him. But God always turned it around and kept, kept uh, uh, favoring him and giving him favor and and, uh, and, he, and he was second in command in Egypt during this famine. And his brothers come to him and they don't recognize him. Genesis 50, he says, brothers, it's okay. What you meant for evil, God meant and turned for good. So that the salvation of many could come today. 
And he did. God turned it to good. So don't give up. For just beyond the battle is the place of victory. Fight the good fight of faith. No matter what, what you can do, understand that God can do more. In John, 4, 1 John 4, 4, he says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The last uh, thing today <coughs> to help you overcome is the obvious rewards for those who overcome. In Revelation, we have seven messages to the early churches. Each church, just like churches today, have their own set of problems. They have their own obstacles that Satan has won ground in. But each message ends with a promise to him who overcomes. In, in the original Greek, the and I'm, I don't want to bore you here, but this is important. In the original Greek, and I don't know the Greek language very well, but I can, I can look this stuff up. <laughs> the structure of each of these admonitions, it says, to him who overcomes. Seven times. To him who overcomes. It's written as a present participle. And I know that doesn't mean anything to you, but what this means is it expresses continuous or repeated action. It's not a one-time thing. It's continuous or repeated action. But not only that, uh, uh, the action is contemporary with the main verb. It's, here's another one. It's a present participle. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I, 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 can, I can look it up. An example given to me was in Mark 14, 22. It says, while they were eating, he broke bread. So you see, we take a step, and God acts. We move in obedience, God moves. We step out in faith, God fulfills that step of faith. And he's right there with us. Now let's look at these seven churches in Revelation and see what God does when we overcome. Revelation 2, he says, Unto the angel of the church, that's the leader of the church of Ephesus, this was the loveless church, to him that overcometh, I will give to him, give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Church of Smyrna, he who, this is the persecuted church, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Church of Pergamos, this is the compromising church. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. That's spiritual nourishment there. To the church of Thyatira, the corrupt church. To him who overcomes, I will give power over the nations. Sardis was the dead church. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. Philadelphia was the faithful church. Hold fast to what you have. He who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Laodicea was the lukewarm church. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Remember, to overcome, we need to get out of our self-reliant zone. And quit depending on ourselves and, and get into a faith zone where we, we believe God and we trust God. And we persevere in all trials and we never give up because when we come to the end of our abilities and trust God, that's when we will see and experience His supernatural abilities. Don't give up because beyond the battle is the place of victory. Look at the last two verses of our text, 5 and 6, as we close. We must cast down all vain imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. We need to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The word thought there could be translated perception. To me this says that, that, that we can be wrong or we can be deceived at times. We are all knowing. We're not perfect. And, and sometimes we, we're amid, we think amiss. So let's ask God to give us discernment in our thought process, everything, every thought that comes captive in our mind, we need to ask God to, to, to help us to discern and, and, to, and to toss out that which is from Satan and to receive that which comes from Him. Be open to His Word and let His truths captivate our minds. This is how we will overcome. It's how Jesus overcame by this Word. 
when he was tempted in the wilderness, what did he what did he keep what did he keep telling Satan when he would come at him with a temptation? Man does not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. Jesus quoted scripture to Satan, and he overcame. Verse 6 says, being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We've got to be obedient before we are to gain the victory over the enemy. We can't, we can't live continually pushing God away and expect to live victoriously. It's not going to happen. We're not going to overcome that way. We need to let the Spirit of God uh, come into our lives, into our heart, and then we must listen and obey uh, to His directives because they're there and you know they're there. You know, you know, if, if the Spirit of God is in you, you know what I'm talking about. We must listen to Him and be obedient if we're going to be victorious. The whole picture of our text this morning is the idea of our enemy making his last stand, working and trenching himself so that he can ensure victory for himself. The gospel is our way to overcome. Obedience to his word and his and His ways will make us overcomers for this day, for tomorrow, and on into eternity when we will finally rest. And here, well done, thou good and faithful servant. As I close this morning, let me say, verse 4 says, that Our weapons are not carnal, but mighty in God. There's thing, if there's things in your life that you've been struggling with, they're not carnal. They're not fleshly. It's spiritual in nature. Paul also said we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities in high places. Our battle is spiritual, folks. No matter what it is, that you've had in the past, <coughs> what you may be facing now, it's a spiritual battle. And that's where we're going to gain ground. That's where you're going to gain ground. By trusting God, having faith in Him, and taking a step of faith. Would you stand as we close this morning?